righty, all righty. Praise God. I said, praise God. It's good to be home. Come on, somebody. Because we got the same father. We part of the same family. We got the same future. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Jonathan. And uh, how many of you, by the way, were at the One Year Millionaire Live for the last couple of days? All right. Wow. Okay. Good to have you. Good to see you. And uh, I usually tell people um, that I come all this way. As a matter of fact, I'm from Texas. I uh, live in Texas now, just north of Dallas. And um, came all the way out here. And I say, I usually come because I want to hear two of my favorite speakers. And that's me and Myron Golden. After hearing your pastor, I said, I told Myron, we need to take him on the tour with us. Then I'll go to hear three of my favorite speakers. Come on, somebody. All righty. I did an excellent job, and uh, so appreciate that. Good to meet your lovely wife and your family, and uh, what a joy to be here with you all. So uh, you may have think that you didn't meet me before, but we met in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Amen? <laughs> all righty. So it's Dr. Breakthrough, just so you know, I can't provide the breakthrough, I just prescribe the breakthrough. However, when people follow my breakthrough prescription, God Almighty provides the breakthrough they desire and deserve. And what's a breakthrough? It's exploding through barriers that at one time seemed insurmountable. Now, by the way, I want to show you a little book. I had my youngest, Jonathan, uh, him and his brother, Poppy, he was eight and his brother was nine when he wrote the book. And I wanted to be able to say his book is now going international. All right, and it's I Am Everything God Says I Am. Amen. And so I'm a guy that never thought I'd even make it out of high school, much less author several books, much less have sons. And uh, my daughter now is also a professor at Temple University, just got her doctorate. And, uh, but it's all based on breaking through for the glory of God. Amen. I say in the kingdom, there's no big eyes and little use. There's just a big God who wants to use you. And if you surrender, he'll use you. So I tell people, relevant church, I got this this morning, and that is it's the perfect church for imperfect people who submit to a God who will perfect them. Amen? Because he loves you just the way you are, but he also loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. <laughs> Amen? All righty, all righty. So real quick, when you can't preach as good as Pastor Jonathan, you got to break stuff and bend stuff and all. <laughs> so... So, so we have things written on boards, like for instance, uh, this says limiting beliefs. Everybody help me out. What does it say? Limiting beliefs. And so here's one of the things I understood, my friend, and that is this, that a lot of us, the Bible talks about they limited the Holy One of Israel. See, it's all based on the beliefs, and most of our beliefs, watch this now, we got our beliefs before we were old enough to be able to check and see if it's really real. And so a lot of our beliefs are based on a lie. So whenever there's lies that we believe or believe in, guess what? We're going to live a very what? Limited lifestyle. Help me out. When there's lies we believe in, what kind of lifestyle are we going to live? Very what? When there's lies we believe in, what kind of success we're going to have? Very what? When there's lies we believe in, what kind of relationships we're going to build? Very what? Limited. So we got to break through. I don't know about you, my friend. So by the grace of God, I had to learn to break through the lies, and I'm still breaking through the lies because the more I study the Bible and the more I grow, the more I find there's lies that I was believing in that were tucked away that I didn't even realize were lies because I thought they were truth. Are you with me? So when you break through the lies, now you can break to unlimited success. Now, who in here, relevant church, would like to have unlimited success instead of limiting beliefs? Raise your hand and say, that's me. All righty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this board in just a minute. And when I break this board, this is symbolizing by the grace of God that we're going to break through the lies. We're going to allow God, my friend, to break in. Jeremiah 7, 8 says, you trust in lying words which cannot profit. So if lying words cannot profit, then the truth is the only thing that can profit. And you got a pastor who preaches the truth. Amen. Amen. I said, Amen. Man, we got too many ear tickling, back scratching, penny pinching, nickel nipping, pink tea, lemonade, soft soaking preachers. Thank God, my friend, we got some preachers like this young man. Come on, somebody. Man, in the last service, I like to say he's like a corn fed, hellfire, wind, window wrapping, shingle pulling, barnstorming, rooting, tooting, figured and narrow minded, lame brain, screwball, hellfire and brimstone, Bible preacher. Come on, somebody. Oh, we're going to have church up in here. Don't get me started. Okay, okay, okay. All right, okay, okay. All right, okay, okay, okay. 
Now, my wife is normally with me. I call her my ABCD. Her name is Nadia. I call her my ABCD. Can I tell you what ABCD stands for? Adorable Brown Caramel Delight. Oh, yeah. Come on, somebody. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We went out to eat the other day. A guy said, would you like some dessert? I said, no, sir. Bought mine with me. 100% natural. No GMOs. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I told her, I said, baby, your eyes are like caramels floating upon saucers of milk. And when I'm in your arms, everything's okay. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, I was in my prayer closet the other day. God gave me another ABCD. I said, hey, babe, I got another ABCD. She said, I like the first one. I said, you might like the second one, too. She said, well, I like the first one. I said, well, you know, nobody said you only have one. You can have two if you want them. Can I tell you? She said, well, sure. Angelic, blessed, chocolate delicacy. She said, oh, go ahead, big boy. <laughs> so, so we had some devotions in the Song of Solomon. Amen. Okay. All right. Amen. <laughs> okay. Bring it in. Bring it back. Okay. 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 It, but the Bible says a merry heart do good like a medicine. Hello? Sometimes people just need to laugh. If you even knew what the person next to you might be going through right now, so again, Satan is a master of lies. So again, I'm going to break through this one. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. All righty? So get ready. Let me hear you say breakthrough time. Ah, uh, come on now. Did you hear the pastor's wife talk about the way she was? That's the way some of y'all sound, like y'all still there. <laughs> okay, you got to give me a little more energy. Come on, breakthrough time. One more time, real loud. Watch it, real close. Break you time! Break you time! Right. We just broke the limits right off our beliefs. Come on, somebody. And when you break the limits off your beliefs, you can now experience unlimited Success. So come on, give yourselves a hand. Now this is what mama used to use when we got out of line. <laughs> okay, I just want you to make sure it's real. Let's see if that, oh, <laughs> that's real, ain't it? All right, you want to check it out, young man, make sure it's real. Your mama said if you don't behave, okay, yeah, okay, uh, all righty. Let's check it out, make sure it's real. <laughs> okay, all righty. So, now, um, <laughs> this is how you should take an offering. No, okay. <laughs> I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to demonstrate something. As long as I believe the lies, I can never do this. Once I started realizing I could have unlimited success in Christ, Philippians 4.13, when I got saved by the grace of God, the first verse they ever taught me, I call it, by the way, Mark, the 10 strongest words in the Bible, I can do all things through who? Christ, which what? Strengthen me. That means if he's going to strengthen me, that must mean I was weak. Right. Do you know there's nothing wrong with being weak as long as you know where to get your strength from? Come on, somebody. So Psalm 144, 1, by the way, blessed be the Lord my strength, David said, that teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. And in my style, Ishinu Karate, David was saying, the Lord is my sensei. Now, when the Lord's your sensei, he trains real good. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, he trains so well, David said, I fought a lion and a bear with my bare hands. Now, he may not have been in karate, Ishinru, or, or Jeet Kune Do, or Taekwondo, but he knew something. <laughs> fought a lion and a bear with his bare hands. Come on, somebody. Psalm 1834, he said, blessed be the Lord my strength, which causeth a bowl of steel to be broken with mine arm. The word broken in Hebrew means bend. So let me show you the difference, something here. Do not go home and try this. Come on now. Oh, come on now. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Just pass that around. 
I'm trying to tell you, when God gets a hold of you, my friend, you're going to start doing things you never dreamed you could do. Come on, somebody. You're going to start doing things that you thought maybe somebody else could do. No, God's going to use you to do some things going to blow your mind. That's good right there. I'm so glad I got saved because I didn't believe, I just thought I could never do anything. But when I got saved and they started telling me what God said about me, I was like, me? By the way, how did I get started in martial arts? Real quick. I was a six-year-old boy. I was out in the middle of a field playing in the ghettos of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. A gang of teenagers came my way. You ever been afraid before where you, you couldn't even move? You were like, <clears throat> I froze in my tracks. I was only six anyway. I figured they were teenagers. I thought they could probably chase me down and... So I didn't even try to run. And how many times we never even give an attempt? We just, we just, just throw, just, and that's what I did. And one guy took his fist, hit me in the stomach, bam, knocked the air out of me. Have you ever been, had the air knocked out of you before? You're like, Aah! you're trying to breathe, you can't breathe, right? Now I'm a six-year-old boy. Here's a gang of teenagers. They start beating all over me. And imagine this, my friend. One of the guys picked me up and slammed me on the ground. Must have been watching WWE or something like that, you know. Now imagine one teenager on a six-year-old boy is enough, but a gang of them. And then they start stomping on me like I'm an ant, a roach. And then they start kicking all over me. They're kicking me and kicking me. And by the time I'm bleeding from every week and bleed, you would think that was enough, but that wasn't enough. One guy flipped me over on my back, took a great big old bucket of tar, and they poured it on my face. They poured it on my body. They took a bunch of feathers. They threw them on me, and they left me there. Thank God somebody finally found me and rushed me to the hospital. But, but I'm telling my friend, my life was a mess. I've been through verbal abuse and sexual abuse and obviously racial abuse. And my friend tried to commit suicide on two occasions. And I told the last service, I'm so glad I failed. Come on now. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And I was in a state of hopelessness, my friend. And that's why I'm so glad it's a church like Relevant Church where you can come when you get low on your hope. You can come and get your hope picked up. Come on, somebody. See, instead of being hooked on dope, we hooked on hope. Come on, somebody. Because hope in the Bible is a well-founded, well-grounded expectation of the future. See, hope makes me live today as if tomorrow were yesterday. Oh, come on, somebody. Huh? And God started changing my life. And, and the way I got the name Dr. Breakthrough wasn't because of me being, it's another guy named Dr. Willie Jolly. He was one of the top five speakers in the world. But we were speaking together at, at uh, Howard University. He said, Doc, Dr. Stan, I know you got a doctor in divinity. You got a doctor in a PhD in martial arts. You're a few credits away from a doctor of naturopath. He said, but no, man, branding's everything. You should be Dr. Breakthrough. He said, because you're the guy you explain breakthrough better than anybody I know. You've had more breakthroughs seem like anybody that I know. And you express to your audience, you teach them. And then they seem to experience it. So you, it's like when a person goes to a doctor and he gives them a prescription. You're the guy when they need a breakthrough, you have the prescription. And I looked at him and I said, I don't know if that's true, but I promise you one thing. I will live the rest of my life to make sure it is. And God gave me Isaiah 54, 3, for thou shalt break forth. And I started looking at the ministry of Jesus. And you talking about Dr. Breakthrough, that was Jesus. Everybody he encountered, they got a what? A breakthrough. <laughs> He went from breakthrough to breakthrough. You know, most people, they're happy that they get a breakthrough in their lifetime. No, no, no. Jesus went from breakthrough to breakthrough to breakthrough to breakthrough to breakthrough. And by the way, so can you, my friend. And what this ministry is all about is empowering people to listen, my friend. See, I used to think barriers are made to stop me. Then I found out, no, barriers are only made to stop those who are not sincere, those who are not committed. But to those of us who are sincerely committed, I can't speak for everybody else. I can speak for me. Are you all sincerely committed? Yes or yes? yes. Okay, I got news for us. For those of us who are sincerely committed, barriers were made to be broken. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have told me that. Guess what? Now it's all about just breaking through the barriers. So that's what we're going to do. I need, real quick, I need eight men to help me out. Uh, eight men and two ladies. Just to hold a board real quick. Eight men and two ladies. We got a little board. Just hold this. And uh, just real quick. Run, run, run. All righty. Eight men. The reason I'm only using two ladies is, see, if I hurt a guy, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> okay. It was just a joke, y'all. Okay. Okay. So everybody's got one? Okay. All righty. 
He's recruiting people now, huh? Okay. All right, so each one of these things, some of these things are things that are trying to hold us back. And by the grace of God, what we're going to do as a team, my friend, as a team, we're going to break through this together. We're just going to use my hands and feet and head and all that kind of stuff, okay? So each one of these, and by the way, for you young people, sometimes young people want a board. I already signed them, so you ain't got to come afterwards. We just sign my board. If you want it, you can already, it's already signed, and that way we ain't got to throw it away in the truck. Okay. Seriously, though, if you got a fireplace, it makes great kindling. But anyway, help me out. First of all, it says like what? Oh, come on, talk to me out loud. I what? Yeah. Come on, we're loud. I what? Yeah. Now, cover up the T and what does it say? Yeah. Oh, come on, somebody. See, instead of saying I can't, we need to say what? I can by the grace of God. See, if you think you are beaten, you are. And if you think you dare not, you won't. If you like to win but think you can, it's almost a sense you won't. If you think you will lose, you've already lost. For this powerful truth we find, success begins with a person's will. It's all a state of mind. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger woman or man, but sooner or later, those who win are those who first think and then know that they can. And by the grace of God, we know that in Christ, we know you can win. Come on, somebody. Amen. So we got to break through that I can't start saying, by the grace of God, I can. Help me out. Say it with me. By the grace of God, I can. Come on. By the grace of God, I can. Come on, somebody. Next thing, procrastination. The largest nation of failures are those who procrastinate. Procrastination leads to devastation. Procrastination is the assassination of your destination. Thus, you must act now. People say, I tell people all the time, Pastor, I tell them, if you're waiting for me, you're already late. <laughs> Hello, somebody. The Bible says, behold, now is accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I'm so glad February 14th, 1976, when those soul winners came down in the ghettos of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the pastor said, we send missionaries to Africa and all over the place. He said, what about the African-Americans in the inner city? What about them? We ought to start a bus route and go down there and try to reach some folks. And he said, we're going to give it a shot. Don't you know the gospel works if you work it? Come on now. Man, they came down knocking on doors down there. By the way, one guy said, Pastor, one guy said, the other guy said, man, this is getting dark out here. It's, this is dangerous. We got to get out of here. And the guy said, listen, I feel led of God to go to one more door. And my house, my house was at one more door. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. And man, they showed me from the Bible I was a sinner. I was on my way to hell, but Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, and that I could be saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And man, I tell you what, I never forget that day. I went upstairs, got a great big old family Bible, came downstairs. My grandfather died. We had this big old Bible. They said, what's the Bible for? I said, well, isn't the Bible holy? They said, yeah. I said, I want something holy around when I get saved. <laughs> Hello? I lived at 2217 North 4th Street in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I got down to my knees, had that big old Bible, and I said, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I deserve to go to hell, but forgive me. I don't trust the priest or the pope or baptism. I just trust the blood of Jesus Christ. Save me now. In Jesus' name, amen. And glory to God that day, I got saved by the grace of God. People said, Why you get so excited? When I got on my knees, I was on my way to hell. But by the time I got up, I was on my way to heaven. Come on now. When I got on my knees, I was a child of the devil but by the time I got up I was a child of the king saved on my way to heaven saved a child of the king man I got something to be excited people why you get so excited listen I'll tell you why if you'd have been like I was nobody ever caring about you and all of a sudden they tell you God in heaven cares you get excited too how come it's okay to go to football games and basketball games and scream and shout act the fool come to church and you're supposed to act like God died That's good, Doc. I appreciate it. I'm taking you with me everywhere I go, I promise. <laughs> hey, listen, 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 listen. I'm trying to tell you, my friend, the Bible says, oh, this Bible is so sweet. This salvation is so good. And what I was living before, before, my friend, all about me and glorifying me and who I could beat up and who I No, 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 listen, my friend, when I got saved, I said, Lord, I don't need that martial arts. And he said, but I want you to pick it up and use it for me. Are you with me? And so now I just use it to point people to him. But this is all kind of stuff. He will empower you to break through if you're ready. Real quick. This says low what? Now, I'm not talking about self-esteem because self-esteem is based on self. And when self is doing good, self feels good. But when self is doing bad, self goes down. But when you have God-esteem. 
Proverbs 3.26, the Lord shall be thy confidence. When you have God esteem, when you realize who you are in Christ, my friend, when you realize that not a million sins nor a million acts of righteousness can change his love towards you, when you realize how precious you are to God. When I married my wife, my beautiful wife, Nadia, I was feeling so uncomfortable because soon as we, from the day we got married, she started calling me her king. I was like, that kind of strong, babe. I mean, I mean I'm, a br- I'm a brother, but I ain't from Africa, right? So I, <laughs> I didn't realize fully who I was. But she said, if he don't know who he is, I'm going to help him. And besides that, watch this. Well, here's what happened after a while. Y'all women slick. She kept calling me king so much, I started calling her queen. She already knew what she wanted. <laughs> By the way, in every man, there's a fool and a king. And women, you got to learn to speak to the right one. Come on, somebody. Oh, okay, okay, I'm stopping. Okay, okay. Know who and whose you are. Real quick. Oh, we got two eye cans. Was there something else? Oh, okay, that, there you go. Yeah, that's switch. Let's make you apathy, right? Church just don't care. People just don't care. Hey, listen, my friend, there's nothing to you or you who pass by. Listen, my friend, seeing folks who are broke, busted, disgusted folks far away from God, they trying everything underneath the sun and nothing's working, and they just keep trying a new thing and a new thing and a new thing. And if they just got hold of the real thing, Coke's not the real thing, Jesus is the real thing. But we need to get on fire and get back to winning souls and get back to witnessing. I tell people all the time, by the way, I win and warn souls for a living. I just do business to pay expenses. Now, what does that one say? Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. Matter of fact, you eat the devil's corn, he'll choke you on the cob every time. Come on, somebody. See, sin, sin is so slick because here's what's going to happen. Sin, sin binds, I sin blinds, sin grinds, but thank God Jesus unwinds. Come on, somebody. And it doesn't matter what sin, how long you've been in, I come to tell you, the blood of Jesus Christ will wash away every sin. My oldest brother, when I witnessed him, he said, Stan, you don't know what I've done. God can't forgive me. I said, no, you don't know the power of one drop of that special blood. Come on, somebody. And he finally trusted Christ, got on his knees and asked the Lord to save him. And God saved him and changed his life. I'm telling you, my friend, it doesn't matter. I'm telling you, you can't handle your sin, my friend. But if you confess and forsake, he'll come in his blood, my friend. Ooh, okay. But we got to break through that, my friend. Some of us have been set free. We act like we're still in bondage. Oh, okay. All right, real quick, that says what? Doubt. Doubt. Hey, in my 58 years of living, here's the most powerful thing God ever taught me. And that is this. See, unsuccessful people, they doubt their beliefs, and then they start believing their doubts. But successful people learn to doubt their doubts. And then they believe their beliefs. He says, say that again. Okay. I said, unsuccessful people doubt their beliefs and they believe their doubts. Successful people learn to doubt their doubts and then believe their beliefs, right? See, some says, well, I don't know how long this, this relationship, I don't know how long it's going to, you say, I doubt that one, it's going to last. Stop playing into the doubt. Are you with me? Okay, okay, so, so, so learn to doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. Okay, real quick. And then the impossible. Help me out the what? Impossible. But if you put a space between the I am and the P, it now says two words, I'm possible. Oh, come on, somebody. Okay, okay, time. Fear, false expectation appearing real. Fear, former experiences affecting reality. Fear, forgetting everything's all right. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Job said, I, the devil said, I can't get to Job. The Lord said, I got I know, I got a hedge. You want permission to get to him? So nothing can ever happen to us unless God already knows and already in advance, he's got a counter move. Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save much people alive. And then others' negative opinion. Say that. Others what? I was speaking with Les Brown in the UK, and this particular time, he spoke first, and then I spoke afterwards. He spoke on this topic right here. It was so powerful. 
Because so many times, like me growing up, I kept hearing, you dumb kid, you'll never amount to be anything. Your dad wasn't nothing. By the way, dad left when I was three, never came home, never called, never sent mom a dime. But listen, my friend, listen, listen, listen. But thank God when I got old enough, I found out where he lived, and I got a chance to go down and witness to him, and then I was able to lead him to Christ, my friend. And by the grace of God, when I graduated from Bible college, my dad, who was never in my life, showed up, my friend, haircut on the front row, three-piece suit and a Bible in his hand. <laughs> Only God. Come on, somebody. By the way, I don't have time to go through it, but when I got saved, everybody laughed at me. My whole family laughed at me, and, and uh, guess what? By the grace of God, I was able to lead every last one of them to Christ, my friend. Every last one of them. It's only God. It's only by the grace of God. But I'm telling you, somebody's got to care, my friend. Somebody, listen, God, you can get that breakthrough. Yes, you can. Okay. And then, uh, other than negative opinion, so I said, less. there's one thing better than that. He said, what? I said, only allow God's opinion to become your reality. And see, God knows the real you. See, you and I are like Gideon. We think, I'm just a coward. I'm hiding. God said, no, 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 no. No, that ain't the you. That ain't the real you. See, I see you when you surrender me. You are a mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, you got the wrong brother. No, no, I got the right one. When the whole world tells you you're nobody, you're nothing, you you got to get in the presence of God and he'll start whispering into your, you're the apple of my eye. You are more than the overcomer. By the way, an overcomer doesn't mean you won't have things to come over. It just means you're going to be able to overcome them. Right. <laughs> okay. And then the last one is excuses. Oh, now don't bow your head because there ain't time to pray yet. <laughs> excuses are tools of incompetence used to build mountains of nothingness, and those that subscribe to them sell them out to be anything. You're either going to make excuses or make progress. You can't make both. True confession. Y'all won't judge me, will you? I use my excuse. See, I got beaten and tarred and feathered as a six-year-old boy, and I was sexually abused and physically abused and racially abused, and, and I was beat with a choker chain uh, uh, by for a dog. And I mean, I be, you, just, you just don't understand. And I was so well at letting people know what I'd been through, and I started using it as a crutch and as an excuse. And then one day, by the way, my excuse was so popular. Watch this. I told people I was in a state of denial. In my book, I talk about denial. D-E-N-I-A-L. Don't even notice I am lying. It's bad when somebody lies to you, but when you start lying to yourself and believing them. And then one day I said, wait a minute. The same energy it takes to make an excuse, I can use that to make progress. By the way, it takes one man, one decision, or one person, one decision. One action to change your life forever. I got good news. You're that person. You can decide. And then you can take action. And so let's break through all that stuff by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. We'll just use my hand, my feet, my head. But we going to do it together as a team. Because when I break this physically, watch this now. I'm prophesying. When I break this physically, that's a spiritual release that's going to be set out, my friend. It's a spiritual release. Come on, somebody. That when I break this, you're breaking forever, my friend. No longer will it have a hold on you. So, each one of you, do not put thumbs back there. I don't know why they get broken. So, don't, don't put thumbs like that. Okay. <laughs> That wasn't a joke. That was for real. <laughs> so you're going to use the palm of your hands, okay? So we're going to use the palm of our hands, number one. Number two, you're going to lock it out. This is not locked. I was at one church, and I had this, and this deacon was holding the board. And he's like, I said, deacon, no, lock it out like this. And I put his hands out. And he did like, I said, deacon, no, put it out like that. And he did like that. I was like, all right. <laughs> I know I was wrong, Pastor. But the show had to go on. I didn't even realize there was a wall not far behind him. See, when you, when you lock it out, then the force goes along the board. When you're back here, now it comes into you. And when I hit that thing, psh, psh, he hit his head, knocked him out. He fell down, knocked him out. Everybody was clapping and cheering. I was like, no, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> I like, me and the pastor about to get sued. <laughs> okay, so okay, so real quick. So let's, let's bring you over here. In between these guys over here, we got to put a rose between the thorns. Okay, <laughs> this is going to be straight up. We're going to put one foot back. And we always got to take these glasses off. Never oh hit a lady with glasses gosh. on. Oh, my gosh. You do not want to see what's about to happen. No, just okay. All right. You hold those for her. Okay. So, and you can relax for now. When I tell you, that's what you're going to do, okay? And you, sir, put yours up. But just turn this, this way. Okay. Yeah. Turn that way. Remember you had yours. Good. 
So let's see, right, right there, like that. You, yours is up, right? And you, you can relax on that. Okay. Top and, put top and bottom. You're going to be safe. Trust me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, top and bottom. I'm break your, your, I'm, I gotta be careful how I say this. I'm going to break yours at the same time. Your boards. Okay. <laughs> top and bottom. Okay, almost touching. Side by side, quick. Okay, you're right next. Well, no, you next. And then I'm going to get you next. Okay. Top, bottom. Glasses off. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's going to be okay. It's, I'm just trying to protect your glasses. Okay. And you're going to be like this. Okay, one foot back. A little closer if you don't mind. Okay. And then you here. Top, bottom. Good. And you. No, we're going to bring you over here because they said you're not afraid of anything. <laughs> no, no, like you. Because it's like this. And just hold on for dear life. Okay. One foot back. No, no. Okay. So, Pastor, get ready now. Okay, so real quick. In the martial arts, we have a secret weapon. Can I tell you the secret weapon? Stinky feet. <laughs> if the force doesn't break it, the smell will. I pr okay. Anyway. All right, so y'all lock it all out. Let's go through it slow, then we'll do it for real, okay? So, uh, let's see. Move her just a little bit, if you don't mind. Good. I'm break these two at the same time. The boards I'm talking about. Come over here just a little closer. Good. Okay? And then we'll go through that one, and then this one, and then that one, and then that one. And then we'll come spinning around here a little closer, sir. We'll go through this one. You come in between her. And then that one, and then yours. Yours is easy. <laughs> and then yours is tilt down a little bit. Bam, and you're taken care of. Okay, all right. <laughs> do not go home and try this stuff. Now, wives, you can do it on husbands, but nobody. Okay, here we go. Okay, hold on for your life, okay? And, uh, all righty. Let me y'all say break through time. Break through time. time. Come on, break through time. 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 Come on, somebody. I know breakthrough is coming by faith. I see a miracle. When, when Dr. Stan, I was like, man, you, you got to come to our church. You got to come to our church. I don't know how we're going to do this because we're starting a new series and it's like, you know, special day. But okay, maybe 20 minutes. He was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. So thank you so much for coming out. This, yes, this was just a preview because what we, what we intend to do, can I, can I give you the vision of what we're going to do? Let me give you the vision. I envision hosting a, an event for the entire city of Riverside, if y'all can help me out. It's going to be called the Riverside Man Games. Yeah, yeah. Women can come and help, but it's the Riverside Man Games. And it's, it's a call to all the men in our city to come out for a day where we'll have, like, you know, men can be men. We're going to be belching, farting, and other things, arm wrestling. But um, uh, we're going to do, like, 10 contests, Texas Hold'em, seed spitting contests, hot sauce, what, all men stuff, right? 
you know, does that sound good for y'all? And then throughout the entire day, like, you know, people, you know, there'll be microbrewing, all kinds of stuff happening. At the end of the day, Dr. Breakthrough's going to come and just encourage and speak to the men of our city. Right? And then he'll come back on Sunday and preach here. Next time I'm coming, I'm bringing my bricks with me. Like last night, I stacked up 22 inches of bricks and broke them. And I'm going to bring my bed and nails like I did last night. Right. I'm going to lay on my nails, put these two big bricks on my stomach. Mark last night took that sledgehammer and broke the bricks. I was trying to tell him this is not a brick. So he finally <laughs> <laughs> broke the bricks while I was laying on the nails and I jumped up. And so I believe that's a picture of no weapon that's formed against us can prosper. So... I just want y'all to know, if he didn't invite me, I was still going to come. And now that he invited me, I'm coming all the time. <laughs> just bring your own insurance policy. <laughs> Anyways, you may be seated. We're going to get in the word in a second here. Um, thank you so much, worship team. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Man, give it up for worship team one more time. These guys are amazing. I'm going to ask you guys to hang out with me for a few more minutes. We're going to get this series started in the book of Jonah. Turn in your Bibles or turn on your Bibles to the book of Jonah. Jonah is after Obadiah, before Amos, I don't know, before Micah, somewhere there, right? It's page 1301 in my Bible, <laughs> the book of Jonah. We're starting this series called The Rebel's Guide to Religion. I'm very excited. God's going to show us some cool things in it. And it's going to be amazing. Your life is never going to be the same. Before I get started, I'm going to ask that we pray because I need prayer and you need prayer. We need to invite the Holy Spirit to teach us. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing in us, through us, for us. God, I ask that you'd speak to us. We didn't come to church to hear from a man or a woman. We came to hear from your spirit, who is the teacher of the church. So Holy Spirit, I invite you to teach us. May we not receive information, but transformation from the inside out. You've already done it. Lord, we just thank you. And God, as you bless us here at Relevant, I ask that you bless all the other churches in our community. We lift up Sandals Church, Harvest Christian Fellowship, the Grove Community Church, Magnolia Church, Elevate Life Church, Generations Church, the Rock Church, City Church, the Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostals, Charismatics. Lord, we lift up our Cal Calvary Chapel brothers and sisters, and our, our, our Catholic brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time do we believe that we are better than anyone else but we are part of your family, bringing good news to our city and beyond. And may the world know our joy is found in you. And may all who hear your word receive you and call on your name to be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone shouts, amen, amen. amen. Rebel's Guide to Religion. You know, religion separates people. Religion is one of those things that's caused more wars and more, more um, uh, atrocities in the world than anything else. People will do the strangest things in the name of religion. In the name of religion. And, and, and I was thinking about this one day, and I was like, why is it that, that the Bible is filled with God's love, and, and we, we sing about God's love, but whenever you talk about religion, people don't want to hear about it. Why is it that whenever you get, you get around religious people, you don't want to hang out with them? Anybody here like to hang out with religious people? I have never seen the word fun associated with religious people. Yet the first miracle that Jesus performs is he's at a wedding and he turns water into wine. How many of y'all want to hang out with that guy? Man, I'd be like, here's some Avion, here's some Aquafina, here's some Dasani. I don't know what you can do with some Fiji water, but Lord... All the Baptists are like, I think we came to the wrong church today. <laughs> Everyone knows it was grape juice. No, it was good wine. It was good wine. That's what Jesus did. Amen, somebody. You never heard a preacher tell it like that. <laughs> They'd been drinking all night. Then Jesus came in and said, try this wine. And like, oh, you saved the best for last. Praise God. Jesus seems to be one of the funnest individuals 
Every time you see him, he's either telling amazing stories, he's at parties, people are inviting him to their house, like, come hang out with us, and religious people are like, oh no, oh no, he didn't. Oh, I, I know he's not hanging out with her. Do you know what she did last night? Mm-mm. I'm going to church. Jesus was cool, man. Oh, yeah. Watch Jesus show up in your world today, hanging out with Kanye. You'd be like, wait a minute. He's not with, he's not with the Pope? No, he's not with the Pope. He's with the Kardashian. <laughs> I won't even go there. I heard somebody tell a joke. He said, like, you know what, if, you, if there's someone in your life that's bothering you and you want to get them out of your life, invite them over to your house. Yes, invite them over to your house and on your coffee table have a voter registration card, a Bible, and an Amway brochure. <laughs> they will never talk to you again. Because they don't want to join your pyramid and they don't want to join your religion and they don't want to vote like you. True story, right? Religion causes all kinds of arguments, fights, wars, conflicts. In the name of religion, in the name of religion, people have enslaved people. True story. It happened. In the name of religion, neighbors have killed neighbors. It happened. It happened just a few years ago. In Africa, people who grew up in the same neighborhood in the name of a religion went and killed people they knew all along. Now, I know some of y'all want to kill your neighbors, but that's not what I'm trying to preach. <laughs> Happens all the time in the name of religion. I was in a, uh, <laughs> we, we don't like religion, but we like rules. We like steps. We like, we like our way of doing stuff. But my wife is the most religious person that I'm in a relationship with. She wants it done her way. I'm like, baby, give me some grace. She's like, no, I, I like it this way. All right. Just... I, was, I was in an Uber. I was in an Uber um, going to LAX recently, and, and, and my Uber driver picked me up at my house. At whose house? My house. In my neighborhood. Uber driver, I get in the car. Uber driver is p punching in the GPS for LAX. I know how to get to LAX from my neighborhood. GPS tells him to make a left on Alta Cresta. I'm like, no, you need to go to right to Van Buren. Like, no, 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 GPS is saying left on Alta Cresta. No, 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 make a right. I know my neighborhood, and the signal here for cell phones doesn't work right, so just follow my instructions. And she's like, listen, I am driving. I am driving, and you are sitting in the back. Let me drive. Let me follow GPS. He was Irish. Um, uh, <laughs> So I'm like, okay, let's just see how this plays out. Thank you, sir. We start driving. He makes a left, takes him in a circle around my neighborhood. Eventually, we land in Van Buren. I'm like, see, I told you, Ranjit. <laughs> we get towards the 91 freeway. GPS is telling him to make a left on Indiana. I'm like, the 91 freeway is right there. Don't turn on Indiana, sir. Listen, sir, I'm driving. Leave me alone. I'm driving. I'm following the GPS. I'm like, really serious right now. So here we are on Indiana. I'm like, it's right there. There's no traffic right there. It could have been, right? I'm looking at the clock. I'm going to be late. I'm like, you are so devoted to your religion. Here's the thing about it. The, the Pharisees in Jesus' time had a GPS called the Torah and the prophets. And so because they were so stuck on the letter of the law, they could not recognize the word become flesh. Here is the living word walking with them, and they're like, doesn't look like the one I've been studying. He doesn't fit my description. He's hanging out with people that, that the word says that he shouldn't be around. And they have a problem with Jesus because Jesus did not come to be your religion. He came to be your family. He came to be in a relationship with you. And you are stuck to your rules and your procedures. Let me tell you something. How many of you love policies? I, I hate policies. 
I like people more than I like policy. You'll understand what I'm saying when you go to the DMV. And, and what you're thinking makes more, can you just do, if you just sign this right now, I'll, I won't have to come back and wait five hours. No, the policy says you have to come and bring back your proper identification. I mean. <laughs> then they ask you, what do you do, what do, you do for a living? I, I, well, I'm nothing. <laughs> I, I, I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I do for a living. You look, you look familiar. <laughs> Confessions of a pastor. <laughs> Jonah chapter 1. In Jonah, the book of Jonah is a, is a book of, of several individuals. One individual is, is Jonah himself. And Jonah is, is given a mandate and a call by God to go and preach a, a word to the Ninevites. The Ninevites are a people that have rebelled from God. And Jonah rebels from God and says, no, I don't want to go to Nineveh. No, never. I don't want to go to no, no. Y- y'all following me, right? Like, no, I'm not going to go to those people. Because Jonah is racist. Religion will make you racist. Because if you think about it, most religion is about a people group. This, 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 come on, can we be real? Mike, is it okay if I'm real? If you're from Saudi Arabia, you are religion-wise. Muslim. If you're from India, you are if you're from Korea, you are, if you're from Africa, exactly, that was a trick question. <laughs> you, you beat on the drums and worship your ancestors. There's, there's this like geographic racial connection to religion. If you're Mexican, you are, I rest my case. And so here's Jonah, he's like, I am a Hebrew. I don't hang out with Ninevites. Though I am part of God's chosen people. No, no, never, ever will I go to Nineveh. It's not happening. And he rebels against going to Nineveh. The Ninevites are in open rebellion to God. And the best rebel of all is God himself. He says, I am going to rebel against your religion. I'm going to rebel against your religion that rejects other people. I'm going to rebel against your religion that keeps people at a distance. I'm going to rebel against your religion that's destroying your life. And I'm going to come in. And so he calls Jonah and says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and cry out against her because her sin is great. Now, if you look at the book of Jonah from a religious context, what you're thinking is that God is crying judgment against Nineveh. But when you look at the heart of God and what happens, let me give you the story before it's over. What happens is that the Ninevites hear the word of God and they repent. And when they repent, God relents. And when Jonah sees God giving grace to a people that he hates, Jonah gets mad. Why did you save them? Do you mean that they have to, they're going to start going to church with me? Are you kidding me? starting a trend where pastors are honest. I go places and people are like, oh, you, you're a pastor. First thing, first thing, nine out of nine people will say, oh, you're, 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 oh, you're a pastor. I love black churches. <laughs> you and your people are the most exciting. The music, oh my God. You know, I love black singers and black preachers. Uh, y'all, some of y'all got very uncomfortable, like, <laughs> very uncomfortable. I just kind of smile. I'm like, uh, well, you should come to our church sometime. <laughs> come and visit the blacks. <laughs> <laughs> then they show up, they're like, everyone is here. How did you do this? How did this happen? Well, when, when Jesus says, if I be lifted up, and not your nationality, and not your politics, and not the way that you vote, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. 
We're not, we're not a multi, we're not a multi-racial church. We are one people with one father ushering the kingdom of God to all people. Are you with me? Religion separates people, it keeps people from a distance, at a distance. So the text says this. Can we get in the, in the word? All right, let's get in the word. Point number one, point number one if you're taking notes. God isn't as devoted to your religion as you are. God isn't as devoted to your religion as you are. Verse number one of Jonah chapter one says this, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. I normally teach from the English Standard Version, and so that's English Standard Version, but I'm, I think I'm switching it up this time around. Why? Because I like my Bible. It's like, it's like calf skin. It's just, it's brand new. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. <laughs> the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, arise. Everyone say, arise. arise. Go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. Cry against it. What is, does that sound friendly? Because you're religious. And the writers of the scriptures were also coming from a religious context. God's intention was to draw Nineveh to himself. Because that's what happens, right? He says, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. So he went down. Everyone say down. He went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down. Everyone say, you went down. He went down into, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah's a man who runs from God, even though God's trying to save people who are far from him. And God's like, no, I, I'm more interested in, in saving than, than condemning. I'm more interested in life than I am with death. I'm more interested in, in choosing love than choosing hate. I'm more interested in healing than I'm interested in disease. I'm more interested in righteousness than I am in recklessness. Jonah's, God's like, go to Nineveh. And Jonah, he says, rise up and go to Nineveh. Nineveh, Jonah goes down to Joppa, goes down into the ship and goes down to Tarshish. Why would he go to Tarshish? Because just like you and I, he was full of Tarshish. <laughs> How far has your Tarshish gotten you? Has it helped you rise up or has it kept you down? Oh, you'll get that on Tuesday. This, just some background on Jonah. Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14, uh, verses 25, and, and he's, he's a prophet that prophesies to the northern kingdom of Israel. He prophesies to the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel never, everyone say never, never, never lived up to God's call. They never obeyed God. They never lived for God. They never repented. They never were in God's uh, will. They were constantly in rebellion to God. And Jonah was called to go prophesy to them. Do you know what kind of prophecy he brought to the northern kingdom, kingdom of, of, of Israel? God's going to bless you. God's going to expand your territory. God's going to give you more than you've ever had before. Jonah knew that the God that he was serving was a God who gave grace to those who didn't deserve. Are, are you getting this? So, so I, I want, I'm giving you background so you understand why Jonah does not want to go to Nineveh. Every time you tell me to go cry out against people, I ended up bringing them good news. I don't want to bring good news to them Ninevites. The word you're going to... No, I don't want you to expand their borders. I don't want you to bless those people. His patriotism and his nationalism kept him from the presence of God. So God rebels. God rebels against that. Just to give you some backgrounds on, on, on the Ninevites. The Ninevites were murderers. They were a rebellious nation. They were a people. <laughs> I like to Google things. I like to go on Wikipedia. I like to read books. I'm a nerd. I know I, I look cool, but I'm really a nerd. <laughs> Do not argue with me. I look cool. I 
was doing some research on the Ninevites, and what I discovered about the Ninevites is that these guys were, were terrorists. They would go and, and, and conquer other nations, kill the men, and let their bodies stay in the roads of the city. But they'll go a little bit further. They'll dismember them. They'll chop off their legs and leave one arm. So there'd be these legless, one-armed people on the streets. You want to know why? So that the people who conquered could go and shake hands with the dead corpses. Sadistic. These are the people that God's sending Jonah to. Evil people. Jonah is the first prophet in all of the Old Testament, in all of Scripture, that has a mission that is just like Jesus. He's the only prophet ever mentioned that went to another people group to bring them news from God. Up until this point, all the prophets, all the prophets were for who? God's people. Jeremiah was for who? God's people. Elisha was for a prophet for who? God's people. Elijah, God's people. David, God's people. They were all for God's people. And God's like, I want to show you what I'm going to do through Jesus. We're going to cross boundaries. We're going to cross boundaries of race, religion, every boundary that separates people. We're going to cross that thing. And you're going to go and cry a message to those people. Let me tell you something. The gospel is, is about a missionary. A missionary who left the riches of heaven, disrobed himself, left the splendor of, of, of heaven and angels worshiping him, and came down as a poor man. Philippians. Are y'all with me? He came down into our context and walked in the streets that mere men walked in and, and became like us, saying, if, if I want to become like you so you can become like me. You can never come up to where I'm at, so I'm going to cross the boundary. I'm going to let the Holy One come and touch unholy lives. That's the gospel. And here's the thing about it. Humans reject what God's trying to do because it's God's idea, and God, God does not think the way that you and I think. Amen? Aren't you glad he does not think the way that you and I think? Now, if I was God for a day, whoo, man, every problem that I see would be solved. Some of you would not even exist. <laughs> Let's be real. If, if I was God for a day, I, there would be no more humans. It would just be me and my wives. <laughs> I'm in so much trouble right now. She's smiling, but she's like, you said wives with the plural. <laughs> yes, it would be you, J-Lo, and yeah. <laughs> Just... That's how we think, though, right? And none of y'all, none of y'all. Mark, you'd come visit every now and then so we can have some theological dis discussions. And then I'd say, boop. Mark gone. <laughs> he overstayed his welcome. Boop. Dion would come by so I could argue with him. Then boop. He was winning. Now he's gone. <laughs> wife would walk in and she'd kind of have an attitude. Boop. Send second wife. <laughs> They're all the same. <laughs> Fine, just myself. <laughs> oh my God. I want to get an email saying he disrespects his wife from the pulpit. I can't be a part of it. Come on, I'm just trying to teach a point. If you were God for a day, it would be messed up. It'd be it'd be busted, disgusted, and insane. Are y'all with me? God does things that is that is completely opposite of what we would think is the right way of doing something. Aren't you glad you're not God? Aren't you glad that the gospel is his gospel and not mine? Aren't you glad that there is no gospel that's only for one group of people or one way of thinking? It's a gospel from God to all men. Let me tell you something about the gospel. The gospel is exclusively his to include you and I. Oh, man. Someone says, there's so many ways to God. 
That sounds like man's thinking. There's so many different ways to God. Uh, you can get there, however, whatever path you choose. Mm. Tell you something. If I asked you, how do I get to Hawaii? And you told me, oh, just get on the 10 and head east. You look at me and say, um, that doesn't sound like the right direction. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except by me. If you come any other way, you're a thief. Y'all with me? So the gospel is exclusive in that it's only his way, but it's inclusive in that it says, I have room for some Africans in my gospel. I have some room for some Koreans in my gospel. We even have room for some Indians in my gospel. We've got room for some Republicans in my gospel. We've got some room for some Democrats in my gospel. We've got room for some, some we don't know what they are in my gospel. I will even, oh, I won't go there. I won't go there. No, not going to go there. Don't want to get that email. It's for everyone. No one has a corner on it. That's why God gives us the book of Jonah to show us that his love has no borders. He transcends borders. He does not respect the boundaries you've created for each other. It goes beyond that. Are, you, are we together? Point number two, religion is God on my terms. Religion is God on my terms. See, here's the thing about it. It says that, excuse me, it says that Jonah left, he, he, he rose up and he went down to Tarshish. Where did he go? Fleeing from where? From where? Fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Where was the, where was the presence of the Lord? It was in Nineveh. Are you with me, Larisha? The presence of the Lord was in Nineveh. Man, let me tell you something. The people that you think God does not dwell among are the people where his presence is. The people that you hate and you judge and you think, wow, God could never use those people. That's the presence of the Lord. Jonah's like, no, 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 I don't, no, no, never, never, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'll never go to Nineveh. Fleeing the presence of the Lord. And God's like, no, that's where I'm at. That's exactly where I'm at. Religion's God's on my, God on my turn. I'm saying that if, if I'm going to serve God, I'm only going to serve him this way. I'm only going to do it this way. I'm only going to accept people who are, who, are not, who are not Calvinist or they're not Armenian. Are you pre-trib or post-trib? Even in the church we get silly, don't we? I was, I was at this one place one time. I just got done preaching. And this lady was in the back. She was like, that was a great sermon. I just have one question for you, sir. Uh, have you received the Holy Spirit? I'm like, yes. She's like, uh, do you speak in tongues? I was like, yes, I do. And so she, she asked me to demonstrate. So I started speaking Spanish. <laughs> I was in Australia. I was like, uh, yo te lo quiero. Uh, soy loco por ti, América. Soy loco por ti, amores. Soy loco por ti. She was like, praise the Lord. <laughs> it was as if she was not going to accept me unless I was... Right? We create these rules, like, unless they do this, unless, unless he's preaching from the New King James. <laughs> what version of the Bible do you use? We get so silly. Religion is God on my terms. And that's why we fail to recognize him when he shows up in a different form. Can I tell you something? A lot of the times, the voice of God sounds like the voice of my wife. That will mess you up. It's like, oh, it's a, she's, is she nagging or is that the Holy Spirit? <laughs> then you see exactly what she said in Scripture. You're like, ah. Oh. 
got me again. God will come to you in ways that you don't expect. Jonah goes down to Joppa, goes down into the boat, goes down to Tarshish. Because he does not believe that God would go to the hurting, the broken, the sinful, and those that are far from him. I'd like to submit that the people you despise the most might be the presence of God. And you're fleeing from them. Wow. <laughs> Jonah was not acting out of fear. Nowhere does it say that Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh. Jonah was acting off of personal preference. And whenever you prefer and not defer to God, you're outside of his presence. Verse 4 says, all right, so he says that he, he was fleeing the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm in the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and they threw the cargo which was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship and lain down and had fallen asleep. God sends a storm to this, to this boat. Did you, any of y'all watch cartoons when you were a kid? Like, I still enjoy them. But remember what, like in the cartoons, like, you know, there'd be a storm on one person? Like just... Like lightning, like, oh, they can't escape it. Everybody else is like, whoa, man, looks as if you have a personal storm going on. Right? The sailors become afraid because there's a storm that's affecting them like they've never seen before. They've never seen this type of storm before. They're like, no, this is not a regular storm. This is judgment. This is from the gods. I mean, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Um, uh, the, the word storms, you know, like, I've never heard, like, you know, any rapper use storm in their, in their like, you know, in their rap song. You know, never. It's a church word. You get around church people, how you doing? Man, giving honor to God is ahead of my life. I'd like to thank him for being here, but I'm just going through a storm right now. Regular people don't use the word storm. You've never heard Jay-Z talking about, Rock Nation, Jazz the storm. Eh. <laughs> He raps weird, you know. Never heard Wheezy talking about, yeah, I need the God of the storm. The storm is a storm. <laughs> never. It never happens. Never heard any, any R&B song talking about the storm. I'm going through a storm. Never. Church word. Get to church, they sing a lot about storm. Through the storm, he is Lord. Right? And we like, you know, we avoid storms. Like, we don't want to go through the storm. We, oh, I'm going through a storm right now. Sometimes the storm is sent by God to course correct you. To get you on the right track, to wake you up. Jonah is at the bottom of the boat. It says that he is sleeping. He's asleep and he's asleep. And so God's like, you know what? I got to rock the boat to wake him up. God will send a storm. The course, I thank God for the storms of a breakup I didn't want. Right? You know, it, was, it was bad during the time. I was drinking, calling my friends, like, hey, man, just come, come hang out with me, man. She broke up with me. And your friends are telling you, you'll find a better one. No, I won't. She was my cuddle bear. I won't find another cuddle bear. And all, all your friends are looking at you like, ah, oh, he's such a <laughs> disgrace. Stop acting like such a biscuit. <laughs> oh, what, 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 do you, what do your friends say? <laughs> and you're just like, oh, my gosh. And then years later, you're like, thank God. I saw them on, I was on Instagram, and as I was. <laughs> you have church like no other, like, like, man, why are you so happy? Mm, girl, I saw him on Instagram. Man, he rescued. 
God rescued me. He rescued me. He gave a praise like you've never praised before. In the moment you're going through the storm, like, oh, they're, they're such, they've, they've let me go. I'm no longer on the job. Two years later, you've started your own consulting business, and you're like, why didn't I do this earlier? God had to send a storm to wake you up, to shake things up. So that, because if it was up to you, you'd have fleed from his presence and gone down to Joppa, gone down to the bottom of the boat to go and be stuck in your Tarshish. Y'all with me? Man. Here's, here's what gets me about religious people. Religious people will retreat from others and become recluse and isolated and behave as if they're not in the same boat as everyone else. Are you with me? They'll, they'll behave as if like, oh, I'm not like those people and you're on the same boat. Thank, thank God I'm not like those people. We're all going to die. <laughs> He's the God of the city. He's the God of... You're here, you're here stuck to your own religion, but you're on the... Jonah is in the same boat. And the other sailors are crying out to the gods like, save us, save us. Point number three. Everyone is religious and everyone has a God. Everyone's religious and everyone has a God. Religion is anything that helps you cope through life or life's events. For some of you, it's Twinkies. <laughs> Others of you, it's exercise. That was for you, Steph. Um, <laughs> just... <laughs> Others of you, it's drinking. Others of you, it's, <laughs> it's other things. Others of you, it's success, it's money, it's more stuff. Every one of you, every, whatever it is that you, you run to when life happens, becomes your God. They start crying out to their gods, help us, help us. But here's the thing about every other God that is not Yahweh, every other God that is not Jehovah. You can cry out to it, you can invest in it, you can pay the dealer over and over again, you can do it, you can go back to those places and, and, and invest in them, but they will never respond. They will never hear your cry. They'll just feed you more of the numbing mechanism to keep you stuck in that place. They're crying out to their gods and, and their gods are not responding. Finally, here's the thing about it. God will let people cry out to their gods until they're exhausted. Rock bottom, they hit rock bottom. They hit rock bottom because they're like, we've exhausted our gods. They've not responded. Let's find another one. So they go down and they find Jonah sleeping. Thank God for keeping me holy. And away from those sinners. Find Jonah sleeping. Watch what happens. Is it okay if we go to scripture? Verse 6 says, so the captain approached him and said, how is it that you are sleeping? No, 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 no. <laughs> you sleeping? Are you serious right now? Huh? What, what? Yo! This dude is sleeping. That's literally what happened. How is it that you're sleeping? Get up. Call on your gods. We've called on ours. And he did, they didn't respond. Can you please reach out? We know that every human has a god. And you have a god of your own. Call on yours. We've tried. All the different mechanisms to cope. And they've failed us. Can you please call on yours? Perhaps your God will be concerned. Man, perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Perhaps your God will be concerned. Perhaps your God will be concerned. There are people in your community, in your neighborhood, at your workplace, 
that are going through storms in life and you are sleeping on the job. What's up? Why is it that people who don't know Jesus know that you know Jesus and they're wondering, why don't you help us? You have the answers. Why can't you call? Why can't you call on your God and see if he's concerned about the rest of us? But most believers like to say, well, faith is a very personal thing, and I don't want to, you know, step on anyone's toes and talk about my faith. I'm just trying to have a good time here at Grapau and just, you know, enjoy myself, and, you know, I don't want to talk about this stuff. And, and God's like, I put you there because the storm that you go through in life is a storm they go through life. And they're calling on their gods, but their gods are not responding. Maybe if you opened up your mouth. Maybe if you said a word of encouragement, they'll know that there's a God who cares for them. Is this good or what? We're out of time. Okay. Let's wrap this thing up real fast. First time guests are like, you know, I was hoping it would be like one of those 15-minute Reader's Digest sermons. Where they kind of tickle your ear and make you feel good. But you've got an angry black guy yelling at us. What's up with that? Is he angry? Is he angry every week? I'm not angry. I'm just emotional, okay? <laughs> and he, a couple times he almost cursed. I heard him. <laughs> almost. I said Tarshish, not... <laughs> Verse 7, each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots. So we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So the cast lots and the lots fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From whom, what people are you? Why is it that we're facing this judgment against us? Why is this happening? Here's the reason why they ask that question. Because the universal religion of all mankind is karma. Everyone believes in karma. This is happening because you did this and in your former life you were an evil man and so you came back like a cockroach. <laughs> At the base level of all human religion is a concept of karma. Why? On whose account? On whose account has this calamity fallen upon us? Man, I love the gospel. You know why I love the gospel? I love the gospel because the gospel is the opposite of karma. Grace is the opposite of karma. God does not speak karma. Religion believes in karma. God does not believe in karma. God believes in you don't deserve it. You've not earned it. As a matter of fact, you jacked it up. As a matter of fact, you're busted, disgusted, and just plain nasty. Let me tell you something. God does not save people because he's like, man, I like Kevin. He's funny. He's handsome. He's amazing. He has a way of, you know, he's a very becoming personality. And he speaks to Trinity. Guys, I think we should include him. He's a great candidate. No. God looks at the, God loves you like Lady Gaga. I love you in your ugly. I love you in your disease. Are y'all with me? If you've hit rock bottom, if you feel as if you've done things that you don't deserve anybody's loving kindness, if you feel as if you're so far gone, I want to let you know you're in the perfect place for God to step in and turn that mess into a message. Turn that nasty into something nice. To turn all of that, to just turn it around. He's the God who turns it around. Are you with me? Man, y'all thought you started recycling now. God's been in the recycling business ever since he, he talked about the gospel. He says, I'm going to take this junk and turn it into a treasure. The religion of this world says, you're already good. You just need a little additive called God and then life will be perfect. No, God doesn't want to be an additive to your life. He wants to become your life. Are you with me? Everyone has a religion, and karma is the universal religion of all mankind. 
They ask him, they say, what's your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? And instead of Jonah saying, I am a man of God, he says, I am a Hebrew. Because that's the most important thing. Can, can, can I tell you something? I, and I, I don't know how to say this, but, but hear me. Hear me. Identity has become a religion. I, I can speak on this with more authority than most people in this room simply because I came to this country when I was eight years old. Grew up in Berrien Springs. Berrien Springs, uh, there were probably five other black people in Berrien Springs. It was my family. Muhammad Ali lived there. And at least when, when he first arrived. And, and, and then there was another African family and they, everybody thought we were related. <laughs> That's why whenever you see Africans, you say, oh, uncle, uncle, uncle. You know. I have a long history of all that. Africans in here like, you know what I'm talking about. Any other African is your uncle. So I grew up in a situation where I'm like, you know, I'm in a class and I'm only, I'm the only, you know, brown guy. And then as the community evolved, other brown people came around. And so you had this thing where you, you wanted to like, you know, identify with something or someone. And I grew up in the golden age of hip hop. Amen. Amen, amen. You know. So, so Chuck D was like, a, was like a prophet of the age. You know, he was telling us to fight the power. And so I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and it changed my life. And with that, I, I went from being a, a, a troubled kid to a kid who now had an identity. And the identity was in my brownness, in my Africanness. So whenever people thought about Jonathan, they were like, oh, that's that pro-black, Afrocentric, you know, I even changed my name. My name was Understanding Seed Shabazz Allah. <laughs> Don't laugh. It was a very powerful name. <laughs> my Understanding Seed Allah, USA. I thought it was cool, you know. <laughs> so that becomes your, you know, you start working through your identity because of, you know, of your lineage and all that. Jonah says, I am a Hebrew. Yep. Okay. Hebrew was his religion, not Yahweh. Are you with me? And so when you discover the gospel, let me tell you what the gospel does. The gospel in Galatians, the apostle Paul says this. He says, in Christ, we are neither Jew or Gentile. We're neither male or female. Because we're now found in Christ. So when the next time people try to label you and say you're this, that you're, you're trans this, you're LGBT, whatever, you're, you're black, you're white, shut up. I'm in Christ. That's the first point of identity that anybody that calls upon the name of Christ should have. I am in Christ. Before I am black, I am in Christ. Before I am African, I am in Christ. Before I am Arab, I am in Christ. Before I am anything that you can label me with on this planet, I need to be known as one who's in Christ. Religion will try to find. Now, I'm not trying. Let me tell you something. When you get to heaven, you'll discover that Jesus is really Mexican. That's why they all named their kids I'm just saying, you'll get to heaven, they'll hand you a harp and a taco. Like, hey. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is how it's going to go down. I've got to get past this stuff because all this stuff is rooted in man's religion. And God is trying to shake it up. Are you all with me? Can you bear with me for three more minutes? All right. Before I'm anything, I need to be found in Christ. Verse 10, he says, they, the, the men became extremely frightened. Right, well, let me go to verse 9. He says, I, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord of God the he of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men feared, uh, became extremely frightened, and they said to him, how could you do this? 
How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Let me tell you something. People who are outside of the faith know how you're supposed to behave if you're a Christian. Whoa, 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 whoa. You call yourself a Christian and you're behaving like this? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? If anybody ever uses that, that you, know, you know you're in trouble. How could you do this? You know better. It's interesting that the people of the world, Jesus gave the judgment on the authenticity of believers to the world. On this planet, the only people who can judge the authenticity of your Christianity are not people in your church. Don't come to me saying, well, pastor, I read all the, I've memorized verses. No, 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 no. People who are outside of the faith have a better judgment call. Because Jesus said, they will know that you're my disciples based on one thing. How you love. How you love. And I hate to admit it, but I'm, I have to be honest enough and love you enough to tell you the truth. Most Christians do not look lovely on social media. You know why? Because you feel as if the more right you are, I'm not talking about politics. Yes, I am. The more right you are, the more Christian you are. And that's Tarshish. Oh, yeah. Just got to tell you the truth. I have to tell you the truth. And then you become... Like, you know, well, I have to tell, I'm I'm speaking the truth in love. Shut up. You're not speaking the truth in love. You're condemning, you're judging, and you're not, you don't have the heart of God. As a matter of fact, you're fleeing from his presence. Because the people that you're condemning and labeling and calling out and trying to be all patriotic about, that's where the presence of God is. That's where the presence of God is. I have to tell you the truth. And that's why they judge you and say you're a hypocrite because your life does not match up with this. Oh, yeah, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Some of you think that the further left you are, you're becoming more like Jesus because Jesus loved all people. And you throw out everything concerning his principles and what he cares about. What if you just said, you know what, these politics and these identity things are of this world. We are a kingdom of priests, kings and queens, heirs of the Most High, co-heirs with Christ, found in Christ. What if we walked around with that identity? What if we were, what if our only job was not to argue our politics and our racism and everything else, but to only say, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? Christ died for all men. If he be lifted up, he... Let's wrap this up. Let's wrap this up. Oh, man. Okay. They said, what should we do? To you that, you that the sea may become calm for us. For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, Jonah speaking, pick me up, lift me up as Christ is lifted up. Are y'all with me? And throw me into the sea. Sacrifice my life and your, the lives of many will be preserved. Are y'all with me? And they say to themselves, that doesn't make sense that an innocent man should die, that many of us should live. Romans 5, verse 17 and 18 says that the transgressions of one man brought all men under condemnation, but the sacrifice of one man named Jesus brought righteousness to many. The gospel does not make sense to a person or a people group who believe in karma. So when they hear this, like, no, 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 no. If we throw you overboard, your assignment would not be complete. And the judgment of God against you would befall us for we block God. And so they do what we all do. Once we receive the good news of Jesus' solution to, to, to bless our life, 
instead of believing God, we go back to our own solution. It says that the men began to row harder. Verse 13, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then, the Lord, then they called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. Verse 14, point number, I don't know where we're at. Number four, salvation starts at the end of your striving. They finally come to a point where they're at wit's end. We've done everything we can in our own power. Now we cry on the Lord. And that's what God's doing. It's like, now that you're at rock bottom, now that you've exhausted all of your energy, let me step in and do something to turn it around. May that be a word for somebody. Maybe you should just quit, give up, and let God come in. Maybe you should get ego. Stop edging God out. And let him guide you and lead you. The moment they do that, they call out on the Lord. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord. After you've experienced God, then you can sacrifice and to live a life for him. Then you can make, the, the, the problem is that every other religion says, you must do all these things first. Make vows, make promises, make sacrifices, change your life first. And then you'll experience. All they did was cry out to the Lord, Lord, help us. We've done all that we can. They follow God's way. God steps in. And after the experience, can you live it out? Are you all with me? After the experience, that's God's way. One man's sacrifice to save many. What I want to let you know this morning is that you can't stop a rebel God full of grace. He will have his way with you. His intention was never to destroy the men on the boat. His intention was to save them. Even in Jonah's disobedience, God was like, you know what? You've put me in this predicament, but you know what I want to do? Not only am I going to preserve your life, but they're going to get to know me too. Whether you want to or not, you can't stop a rebel God who's full of grace. You can't stop a rebel God because when God, even, even when you're trying to do things in your own effort, God is offering you salvation. Even when you're trying to change things for yourself, God is offering change from the inside out. Not cosmetic change. Are you all with me? And he won't stop. He won't stop now. As we close this thing and we bring it to an end, I wonder if there's some of you who've been going through a storm in life, wondering why is this stuff happening? Why does it keep on continuing? Why is it that whenever I keep trying something, it, it, it never relents? Why is it that, that my life seems to be getting nowhere? I'm trying to roll back. I'm trying to go forward. I can't go forward. I can't go backwards. I'm just stuck in this place. Maybe it's because God is saying, call on my name. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to call upon the name of the Lord. Just as these men on the boat called upon the name of the Lord. If you're a Christian already, I want to give you an opportunity to re repent from keeping the Lord to yourself because of your own prejudices, whatever they are. Your fears. Because the people around you are saying, how can you remain silent? How can you be asleep when I'm going through a storm and you hold the key? Wherever you are, we have an opportunity to respond to God right now. And allow the rebel God full of grace to take over our life. To step in and show out. Amen.